Good afternoon and good morning, distinguished speakers and all participants. I'm Sinjo, Research Director of Integrated Sustainability Center of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. It is my privilege to welcome you to our session titled Harnessing Synergies and Advancing Indicators and Keys to um, ISDG Acceleration. This is a thematic track of the International Forum for Sustainable Asia and the Pacific, ISAP 2023. And this session uh, focuses on accelerating uh, sustainable development goals uh, through harnessing synergies and advancing indicators and data. As we surpass uh, the um, midpoint of uh, the 2030 agenda, the significance of the SDGs uh, in shaping a sustainable and equitable future has never been uh, greater. And this session is a convergence of experts uh, who uh, will bring a wealth of knowledge and insight uh, into accelerating the progress towards uh, these uh, vital um, goals. Today, uh, we discuss uh, the yeah, essence of uh, leveraging uh, synergies among the SDGs and the critical role of advancing indicators in measuring and preparing uh, our progress. Our distinguished uh, speakers uh, will unfold the layers of interdisciplinary strategies, innovative approaches, and practical uh, examples that underscore the dynamic nature of SDG interlinkages and their important role in global uh, sustainability efforts. And this is the uh, an online session and very happy uh, to welcome uh, four uh, speakers. And here at IG's uh, headquarters, I'm joined in this room um, by Professor Renjula Baliswan from Sweden, and we also have two guest speakers joining us online, um, Professor Vivika Pom from Sweden and Professor Min Xu from China. Our guest speaker, um, Dr. Yung Yimin from uh, UNDESA, uh, unfortunately could not join us uh, online today, um, but she uh, kindly uh, sent us uh, a recorded uh, uh, presentation. Without uh, further uh, ado, uh, let us uh, start uh, this uh, uh, exciting uh, session. So our first speaker is uh, Professor uh, Renjula Baliswan, uh, Research Director at Center for Sustainability Research, SIR, um, Stockholm School of Economics, and a Professor of Economics at Sorotron University. Her research focuses on economic development, sustainable finance, sustainable development, gender, and circular economy. And today, she will talk about leveraging sustainable development goals, interlinkages for acceleration towards the 2030 agenda. Professor Baliswan, please. Thank you, IGS, and thank you, Dr. Zhu, for the invitation. And um, as you said, I will be discussing about leveraging sustainable development goals, interlinkages for acceleration towards Agenda 2030. Um, Milton Friedman said that don't judge policies by intentions, but results. So policies and programs cannot be considered in silos and results are usually interactive. And Thus, most of my research has been about, uh, is now based on system thinking and policies that target sustainable development goals or development are not a zero sum trade off. So, using my our research with some of my collaborators, I would like to demonstrate the objectives of today's presentation. Um, I will be talking about leveraging sustainable development goals into linkages to achieve acceleration towards Agenda 2030. And while discussing that, I would like to talk more about this being not just only about sustainable development goals, but about the global development agenda. And specifically within this presentation, I will focus on our my research on energy, SDG 7, and sustainable consumption and production, uh, SDGs 8 and 12, and climate change, SDG 13. 
And finally, the third objective of the presentation would be to look at the post-COVID-19, reviving the decade of action and reviving the sustainable development goals um, that, uh, that were set a little bit aback due to the pandemic. So the global agendas um, by themselves, whether we are talking about um, sustainable development goals, or we talk about circular economy or Sendai framework or human development index or Paris agreement, most of them, they themselves have synergies between them itself. So if you look at some of the recent work that has been done about the UN's latest report talks about the fact that 80% of the synergies between the climate action and uh, sustainable development goals is present. Uh, what these synergies do is they avoid duplicating um, the economic and social investments, and they accelerate the promotion of sustainable development goals focusing specifically on sustainable development goal number seven. Uh, if we look at the sub-Saharan African region, the annual investment is about uh, $27 um, billion. But if the climate change policies were missing, we would need an additional $6 billion. Similarly, in terms of implementation of air pollution, um, control of greenhouse gases and mitigation of these gases saves us about 40% of the global population uh, uh, from particulate matter, uh, which leads to better health. And this is especially true for uh, populous countries like India and China. And uh, what this is, uh, uh, this is also a goal for the WHO. So implementation um also involves trade-offs and trade-offs can be largely explained in terms of the um uh, you know the progress that one makes in certain sustainable development goals and how they negatively affect others and uh, some of the major trade-offs exist between sustainable development goals 1 8 9 and then their trade-offs with the climate change goal in terms of sdg 13 but at the crux and at the middle of this is uh, the uh, fact that uh, we use fossil fuels for energy. And thus, uh, many of these trade-offs are triggered by that uh, interlinkages. So within our new research, what um, we see in terms of the figure that you uh, observe on your screen in the presentation, is that at the vertex of all development agendas, whether it's sustainable development goals or Paris Agreement or circular economy, our research, and this is a group of researchers that I work with in India. Uh, so my work with Pritha, Pallavi and Sharya, uh, we see that um, at the crux of this is the people-centric sustainable development goals irrespective of what kind of global development agenda we speak about. And this is still uh, research in action. So we, you will hear more about this as we make progress in terms of our research. Coming back to the topic of sustainable development goals, interlinkages can be observed. And here I have the data from OECD countries particularly because the data from some of the other regions of the world is limited. So if you look at the sub-Saharan African countries, we have very sparse data, but here we have uh, data from OECD countries that have relatively better reported data on sustainable development goals. And if you look at the middle of figure, uh, figure B, what we are doing here is network analysis in terms of looking at the connections and interlinkages, whether these interlinkages are synergies or trade-offs uh, between various sustainable development goal indicators. And using data from the UN on SDGs uh, between the years 2000 to 2017, we uh, investigate about a million observations 105 indicators and 217 countries. And using centrality measures and modularities based on community de detection, what we find is 
that within the SDGs, there are some community of SDGs or SDG targets or indicators that come out and um, show that there are strong synergies. We don't find very trade, uh, very strong trade-offs within um, this analysis. So what we find is three categories where the policymakers could focus. Uh, the first one is, of course, um, the interlinkages between the economic, social, and environmental goals. The second cluster of policies could be focused on institutional aspect of social, environmental, and economic goals. And then finally, there's another cluster of policies um, uh, that could be focused on gender and institution. So within the SDGs, that's the kind of interlinkages our results show. And this is work that I have published together with uh, Dr. Ranganathan on modeling interlinkages between SDGs using network analysis. All right, so we also have, and this is work that I've done together with uh, Dr. Karimu and Dr. Grod, um, who also is my former PhD student, where we have looked at sustainable development goals and renewable energy transformation and employment. But we've also focused on renewable electricity prices and SDG 8, and we've looked at industrial electricity taxes and how that interacts with um, responsible production and consumption and how that leads to unemployment. And some of the broad results that we get is renewable energy has positive and significant employment impact. And in fact, the net positive employment impact of renewable energy transformation can be amplified if this transformation is quicker and larger. Uh, we also find strong synergy effects of renewable electricity prices and SDG 8, which is decent work. And in terms of higher electricity taxes, we see that our results show that they actually lead to higher sustainable um, consumption and production and a decline in unemployment. We've also investigated the most regressive uh, sustainable development goal, um, which in fact is an important sustainable development goal and is very interconnected with all the other sustainable de uh, development goals, which is goal number 12 on sustainable consumption and production. And um, here you could refer to a cluster of various uh, experts and uh, researchers, eminent researchers from around the world where their work has been edited into some of these recent volumes. So I could direct you to the sustainable consumption and production volumes on um, uh, challenges and development and circular economy and beyond. And then uh, the informal sector and the environment where the focus is more on the developing countries, the informal sector within the developed and developing countries and how that impacts the environment. And of course, later I will talk about the most recent book, uh, work that we have done together with a whole lot of experts around the world. And um, this is work co-edited with the Yongi Min from UNDESA. So, um, Finally, coming to the third objective, where we look at the sustainable development goals and the impact of COVID on these sustainable development goals. And in this recent research um, that focuses on that, I've worked with researchers Francesco, Marina, and Ashok from uh, Royal Institute of Technology and Uppsala University. And then at Sadhathan, I worked together with my colleague on sustainable finance and looked at how sustainable investments were affected uh, under COVID. And uh, broadly, what we find is this. COVID, and this has been also documented by more recent studies, um, COVID actually had a major negative impact on the sustainable development goals and how long lasting this um, impact is would depend on how well the policies were continued to be implemented. And here I'm talking about the pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical policies that were introduced during the COVID time. So what we find in this research is about 144 
of the 169 targets, which is about 90% of the targets of sustainable development goals, were negatively impacted. And about the remaining 10% kind of benefited, but it also depends on how appropriate decisions were continued to be made in terms of these specific, um, you know, health and uh, well-being related uh, and innovation related um, sustainable development goal targets. Um, in the work that we've done together on sustainable investments during the COVID crisis, what we find in these two publications or, you know, uh, papers that are submitted for publications is that their sustainable investments actually performed decently during the COVID crisis. And we actually do find some uh, evidence for investor surplus during the crisis. So in effect, given this wide, broad um, research uh, that I've introduced to you uh, during this uh, presentation, we would argue that leveraging sustainable development goals is possible through the interlinkages, through the synergies. And in fact, the synergies are pretty strong and can help in accelerating towards achieving Agenda 2030 or the Sustainable Development Goals. Let me end here. And if you have further questions that you don't get in during this session, please feel free to contact me at this email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Baliswan, uh, uh, giving us a lot of um, interesting um, uh, results of your uh, research. Particularly, I think uh, the uh, interlinkages between uh, the uh, 2030 agenda and other um, global uh, processes uh, addressing uh, the uh, um, crisis that human uh, facing is very uh, impressive. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Yung Yimin, uh, Chief of the Sustainable Development Goal uh, Monitoring uh, Section at the uh, Statistics Division of the United Nations uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. She is responsible for the program of the global monitoring of the progress towards the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development at UNTESA. Let us listen uh, to her uh, recorded talk on harnessing uh, synergies and advancing uh, data for SDG acceleration. Thanks very much for inviting me to this ISAP session on harnessing synergies and advancing indicators, keys to SDG acceleration. My name is Yong Yimin, and I'm the chief of the SDG monitoring section as a statistical division of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. I'm sorry that I cannot join you in person today. In this presentation, I would like to share with you the key findings from the recently published the Sustainable Development Goals Report 2023 Special Edition, focusing on how to harness synergies and advanced data for as SDG acceleration. Today, eight years after the historical declaration of the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, how much progress have we made and how much more ground must we cover to fully implement the SDGs by 2030? The SDG Report 2023 Special Edition offers a sovereign assessment of the global progress towards achieving the SDGs. Insights derived from the latest global level data and the custodian agency's analysis shows among the accessible 138 targets, a merely 15% are on track to be achieved by 2030. Nearly half, 48% of the targets, show moderate or severe deviation from the desired trajectory. Furthermore, over one-third, 37% of these targets have experienced no progress or have regressed below the 2015 baseline. So conflict, climate change as a lingering effect of the COVID-19 pandemic and other global challenges are threatening to derail hard-earned progress towards the SDG. This chart shows you the detailed progress assessment for the 17 goals 
呃 based on um the target that has data available. The world could face big misses across the goals by 2030 if we do not take immediate and concerted actions, mobilize resources effectively, and ensure sustained commitment for, from governments, organizations, and individuals worldwide. The report shows that on the current trends, 575 million people will still be living in extreme poverty in 2030. In education, the impacts of the years of underinvestment and the learning losses are such that by 2030, some 84 million children will be out of school and 300 million children or young people who attend school will leave unable to read and write. The way things are going, it will take 300 years to end child marriage, 286 years to close gender gaps in legal protection and remote, remove discriminatory laws, 140 years to achieve equal representation in leadership in the workplace. Despite these setbacks, there's a reason for hope. The world has made a critical advancement in recent decades in areas such as poverty reduction, reducing child mortality, and access to basic service. We still can make the next seven years count, but the clock is ticking. Looking ahead to the 2030 deadline, the task of rescuing the SDG is daunting but possible. With the surge in action and the investment we can deliver, on the central commitment to end the poverty and leaving no one behind. The UN Secretary General laid out a rescue plan for people and planet, which is centered around the following three major breakthroughs. Equipping government, governance and institution for sustainable and inclusive transformation. Prioritizing policies and investment that have multiplier effects and cross the goals, securing a surge in SDG financing and enabling global environment for developing countries. The report lists 29 recommendations that have a multiplier impact across SDG, such as invest in women and girls for strong synergies across the SDGs. Build digital infrastructure and the digital literacy for ripple impacts. Lower cost of capital for renewable technologies. Support just transitions and shock responsive social protection. And invest in peace and addressing underlying drivers of vulnerabilities. Investing in better data is key to supporting a rescue plan for people and the planet. First, unleashing data innovation. The unprecedented data demand driven by the 2030 agenda has acted as a catalyst for data innovation. For example, embracing modern technologies and inclusive approaches to improve traditional data sources, such as household survey, using telephone and web data collection method to make them more efficient and inclusive. Meanwhile, non-traditional data sources, such as administrative records, satellite image, and citizen-generated data, have emerged as valuable sources in building data gaps. Ghana has repurposed data from civil society organizations to inform policies on marine litter, helping shaping coastal and marine management policies in the country. Bangladesh has successfully generated poverty estimates for smaller geographic area by integrated satellite image with household survey data. Second, build important data partnership. Countries need to take a whole of society approach to meet the monitoring needs of the ambitious 2030 agenda. Building new data partnership within and outside the national statistical system is important. 
At the national level, for example, in Cameroon, Mozambique, and Uganda, regular stakeholder meetings on SDG data are organized to review and validate national sub-national SDG report. At the international level, the recent launched UN Collaborative on Citizen Data aims to strengthen the capacity of national statistical offices, academia, and civil society organizations in leveraging citizen data for the SDG. Through this collaboration and partnerships, innovative approach and best practice can be shared. Third, uh, increase openness, accessibility, and effective use of data to achieve better data impact. For example, the Gambia National SDG 16 survey, which measures citizen satisfaction with government services, lead to the establishment of a new ministry overseeing public services delivery by the newly elected president. Last but not least, invest in data and statistics. Despite the critical role data play, NSO are facing significant funding gaps, particularly in lower and middle income countries. Approximately 23% of NSO in lower and lower middle income countries are experiencing severe funding shortages, with funding gaps exceeding 60% for their statistical programs. About 50% NSO in this group facing moderate funding gaps ranging from 20 to 60%. The reason launched the Hangzhou Declaration as a fifth world data form called for urgent and the sustained increase in the level and the scale of investment in data and the statistics from domestic and international actors. The 2030 Agenda set a clear vision of what we can achieve. It's now up to all of us to ensure that the journey is successful and it's gain irreversible. We own it to ourselves and to future generations to achieve the SDG in full and on time. Thank you for your attention. For more information, you can read the SDG Report 2023, which is available in six uh, UN official languages. You can also quickly find the SDG data through natural language queries using the newly launched the UN Data Commons for the SDGs. I wish you a fruitful discussion and a successful session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yung Yiming, um, to uh, introduce uh, about uh, the latest uh, uh, special edition of the uh, UN DESAS um, uh, report uh, on assessing the um, SDG um, progress around the world uh, by indicating um, the huge gaps that we're facing, um, but also by recommending uh, a, a lot of um, uh, multipliers that can help uh, accelerate on the uh, SDG uh, progress. Thanks uh, a lot. So our, our third speaker is uh, Professor Vivika Palm, uh, Director of the Department of uh, Sectoral and uh, Regional uh, Statistics at Eurostat, uh, European uh, Commission, and Associate Professor at the KTH, uh, Royal Institute of um, Technology, Sweden. So her research focuses on environmental uh, accounting, input output analysis, uh, and life cycle assessment. She will share the lessons uh, learned from uh, Sweden and the global uh, SDG uh, follow-up. Professor Palm, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to the session. I look forward to talk to you. I will uh, base my talk uh, on, on the work that uh, I was doing together with the other colleagues in the statistical follow-up of the SDGs, the UN statistical follow-up of the SDGs, where we then, um, I come from Sweden, so I was part of the statistical office and the general follow-up in Sweden. And uh, this, uh, this talk will be coming from the book that will be uh, presented later on uh, at this session. And uh, it gave me a chance to, to think about and wrap up some of the lessons learned from from the follow-up in Sweden and the global uh, also to to then see what happens right now I work in the EU where there is a similar follow-up for all the EU countries um, and also there I have uh, had 
a lot of work within the follow-up system itself. So that uh, is what, what I'm aiming to talk with you about here. So next slide, please. Um, so one thing that can be said is that the monitoring of the SDGs globally, the one from the UN that, that we just saw from Yogi Min and the countries show that there are policies that can improve the situation and result in a more sustainable development. It's also clear that if there is lack of important policies or if the existing policies are too narrow, then that can also be seen in the outcome of the, of the measurements. So I would want to stress that monitoring itself doesn't necessarily achieve sustainability as an outcome, but it really serves to highlight what is working and what is not. So we need to have our eyes on, on both uh, the results, but also what is it that needs to be happening as policies for, for something to, to actually move. Next slide, please. Um, so um, basically the, the perceptions of what is valuable and what is possible in the country will give a set of policies. Oh no, now someone is starting to drill in my building. I hope you will not get too disturbed by that. So uh, the policies could be, and very often they are sectoral. It could be economic policies, social policies, or environmental policies. And the outcome of those will partly be wanted and perhaps also slightly unwanted. And this can then be visible in the indicator follow-up. So this is possible to make such an assessment and to see how to make the sectorial policies better also for a sustainability setting so that the drawbacks or in other fields are not so big. And then the policies can of course be redesigned and, uh, and this is then a cycle that hopefully will bring us towards a better set of policies and more sustainability. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, in this in this uh, chapter that I've written, I've just uh, sketched what type of general policies uh, we see for each and every one of the sustainability goals. So you can see, of course, the same social security systems are something that are important to protect the poor, the hungry and the vulnerable. And uh, this is also something that comes back in the UN follow-up, that several of these types of policies are also part of the, of the system where you can see how they work. So I've used the UN follow-up to, to uh, give examples of how this looks like in the, in the world. Next slide, please. So um, it's very clear, even uh, across Europe, it's very clear that the country results differ. And uh, if policies are in place, if they are implemented, then that is also visible in the outcome. So you can see that countries with social security system that cover most of the population, they are generally having a better outcome in all sorts of ways. And we can also see that for regions that have committed themselves to implement environmental protection, they have a better position when it comes to air and water quality. So for every goal, there are typical policies that can be implemented. And depending then on political choices, these policies can be changed. They can change also to the better or to the worse in some sense. And the funding or the follow-up provided can also differ over time. For, for environment, in most areas, there are international conventions that countries have signed to agree on minimum standard or rights, but there are also areas where where this is lacking, as maybe you talked about yesterday, I, I assume if you were discussing biodiversity, for example, I think there are still several white dots on the map here that, that we uh, still need need to f find out how to actually make make it work so that the environment is protected enough. Next slide, please. So this is an example uh, of the from the UN follow-up of population covered by social protection. So we see both population covered by at least one social protection benefit, which is then slightly less than 50% of the world's population, and also the vulnerable persons covered by social assistance, which is for the world and around 30%. But as you can see, the difference between 
the high income countries where 85% of the population are covered by at least something and the low income countries where only 30% are, is they are quite stark. And of course, this makes a big difference in the chances you have to take or the possibilities to actually receive a, a, a life that that is uh, where you have a possibility to, to have a, enough income, for example, to, to sustain your family and yourself. Next slide, please. So I thought when I wrote this chapter that areas that are problematic for Sweden that was sort of thought of as an area, uh, as a country with a lot of data, with a lot of interest for sustainability, if, if we have a problem in Sweden doing it, then, then it's very likely that it's a problem everywhere. And uh, looking at the numbers for Sweden, the renewable energy and the education for all seems to be crucial aspects that really have a large impact for all the other goals as well. So I would claim then that these are two areas that are important for, for every country over the globe. So that we need to continue to invest in renewable energy sources. This is, like Randula also told us earlier, this this uh, presentation that this will have a benefit on many of the goals, both on the energy side, on the consumption. Basically with renewable energy sources, you get very, you get much closer to a sustainable economy because the energy is sort of ingrained in the economy. And it also provides then a better chance to fight the climate crisis and, and uh, to uh, decrease the problems with air pollution. So in Sweden, there has been policies that have moved the heating of houses to renewables. And we have then both heating and electricity that is virtually carbon free at the moment. Uh, this has been done through insulation of homes, switching of fuels. We've had energy taxes on the fossil fuels since the 1990s. And this has also then changed the, the opportunities to, to come in with new types of, of uh, energy, such as combined heat and, and electricity production. And there has also been a lot of support to renewables. What we still need to deal with is the fossil fuels uh, for the transportation sector and then um, there is coal in the used in the steel making where there is now um, investments to see how to move that to renewable sources via hydrogen next slide please the other major game changer in the sg framework is to find effective ways to support vulnerable groups and specifically uh, around the many vulnerable groups there will always be children and youth and they will if we can help them to uh, to finalize school and to find a gainful employment uh, this is a, a, a major important work to to be done also we have seen in this work that there is a lot of hidden violence uh, in the family where often most often women are subjected to violence from their partners. There is also um, more violence towards children than, than what we can really follow in, in the statistics. But but this these are areas where policies can be uh, helping the situation. So uh, this is one big thing to, to work on that could also make the situation better, I would say, for all the goals. So in Sweden, uh, it, we have been using the Child Convention to find ways to decrease violence in the, in the lives of children and also to uh, make the education system work for everyone. So there is an agency um, for youth and civil society and they have made studies to try and find how to strengthen the work on children's rights. One of the reports is called 10 Reasons for Dropping Out, which is tightly linked to one of the SDG indicators on uh, children that are neither in education nor in employment. And uh, there is also discussions ongoing on how to support families with children that have some neuropsychiatric conditions better, because this can also be a, a reason why it's hard to actually uh, attain your education. So um, for us, the Child Convention has really been uh, a good factor in this, in this work. Next slide, please. Um, 
so I would also want to say that it ha sometimes with vulnerable groups, we, we made a special study in Sweden trying to find ways that that aspects that make people more vulnerable. And uh, the one area that is easy for, for everyone from every political aspect of, of society to find that it's important to make support, it's for children. And this is also something that has now been uh, moved into the regional sustainability work that uh, this is an area that many people feel engaged in and, and can want to, uh, to move forward. Um, so the educational goal is, I think, still uh, something that needs to be worked on to get more children to, to go through and actually su succeed in school. This, uh, this indicator, the so-called NEAT indicator in the follow-up shows also in the European setting that there are still somewhere around between at least 10 up to 18% of children that don't really manage to get out and get some get a proper education enough to sort of have find a gainful employment. So by increasing the focus on children and, and finding ways to decrease the violence in their environments, then possibilities for preventing many problems are, are apparent. So uh, this I would claim is, is important for all of us to try and get a handle on. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, I'm sort of repeating things that I already said, which is good because I only have 10 minutes. Um, I also wanted to lift up, well, okay, so uh, if we look into the world, I should also say in the global follow-up, you can see that the children, neither in school nor in employment, seem to be much larger. So it could be between 10 and 30%, and then also with large gender disparities. So this is also seen in the UN follow-up. Um, there is, in Sweden, the corporal punishment of children were, was forbidden in 1973, but uh, it is still allowed in many countries and seen as a normal part of the upbringing. So right now, only 62 states have full prohibition, um, and that means that it's around 13% of the world's children. So I think also here, this is not very, it's not seen in the statistics, it's not something that perhaps we pay a lot of attention to but it is there and it really affects the possibilities to, to become an adult in a, in a nice way and, and be able to take responsibility for yourself in a nice way. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my conclusion and the end of the presentation, policy coherence. So a too narrow focus on what is valuable in society is a recipe for incoherence in the policies. And uh, this happens when the system's in place to alleviate poverty or for, for on the social side or pollution on the environmental side are very narrowly focused. And if they leave large parts of the population or the ecosystems outside of the system boundaries. So thank you very much. Thank you very With much, that, Professor Palm. And thank you very much for also keeping time within 10 minutes. Sorry for push within this limit. Um, so uh, I think uh, Professor Palm uh, shared uh, uh, a lot of um, experiences uh, from uh, uh, Swedish uh, perspective, uh, um, emphasizing on the um, uh, importance of uh, good policies to meet um, the SDGs and also the importance of uh, indicators. Um, I think um, particularly uh, also shed lights on the implications uh, for uh, uh, other countries in the world. Um, so our fourth speaker is uh, Professor uh, Ming Xu, a chair professor of carbon neutrality and associate dean of the School of Environment, Tsinghua University, China. Uh, prior to this position, uh, he was uh, a professor in School for Environment and Sustainability and a professor in Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan, U.S. His research focuses on environment systems engineering, life cycle assessment, and environmental artificial intelligence. Today, he will talk about an innovative uh, approach to principal indicators to mon monitor the SDGs. Uh, Professor uh, Xu, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. 
All right, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to talk about the so-called principal indicators. That's a term I created. Uh, so I'll explain you what that is. Um, so I think I can quickly skip this slide. It's just a history of uh, development, sustainable development. And uh, um, in two, 2000, we have uh, MDGs. And today we have uh, SDGs. And uh, uh, we all know about what SDGs are. So I will uh, probably will not talk too much about this. But um, we know that uh, SDGs have a hierarchy of uh, uh, indicators. So at a high level, we have uh, 17 SDGs, and then we have uh, a set of uh, SDG targets. And for each targets, we have also uh, uh, multiple specific measurable SDG indicators. Right? So we have a, a suite of uh, indicators, uh, actually a large number of indicators to help us to monitor the progress of each country uh, towards the SDGs. Um, the leaving, leave no one behind is a, a, a key promise of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And uh, in order to achieve that, we should be able to, we should, we have to monitor the progress of SDGs for each country. So as a result, we have uh, multiple uh, international organizations, including the UN, including the World Bank, which um, curate, curate and uh, maintain uh, a, a database of in SDG indicators. For example, the World Bank have, uh, has uh, 351 indicators for, to measure the 17 SDGs uh, for over uh, 200 countries from uh, 1990 to, to, to today. Right? So it's a big uh, undertake. Um, so uh, people have estimated that um, in order to get uh, all those SDG indicators um, curated and maintained and uh, collected, monitored, we need over 1,200 partners and need uh, around 45 billion US dollars of uh, financial uh, cost. And we have some uh, uh, resources available, but the cost gap is estimated uh, at around 10 billion US dollars just for data collection to monitor SDGs, right? Uh, <clears throat> so this is a, a big problem and challenge. So it's uh, also motivate us to think about uh, if whether we can extract a smaller set of indicators, what we call uh, principal indicators, to represent the most variation of all SDG indicators so that we don't need to, uh, or we, uh, um, if we only monitor a small, smaller set of indicators with lower cost, but we can still um, uh, effectively monitor the SDG progress, that will be uh, you know, great, right? So uh, we, uh, there are two considerations for this uh, principal uh, indicators. First is the variation. So uh, the principal indicators should represent the most of the variation of all the SDG indicators statistically uh, they should be highlighted, uh, highly correlated with other indicators. So uh, if they're highly correlated, so monitor one indicator can represent uh, the variations of uh, changes of others. Right? Uh, so we use principal component analysis and multilinear regression to quantify this variation. I'll skip the technical details. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see uh, the health outcome. This particular variable, this particular indicator uh, is highly correlated both uh, positively and negatively with a set of other indicators. So if we have good data on this particular indicator, we are uh, to some extent we can uh, represent the changes of uh, other indicators uh, as, a, as a group, right? The second consideration for principal indicator is cost, right? So we want to uh, collect the data, collect uh, data for indicator, indicators that we already have a good infrastructure to collect data for uh, so that the cost is is the uh, the investment financial investment is already there? It, there's no need or limited uh, need for additional cost, right? So we we essentially we can use um, for the existing SDG indicator database some data uh, some indicators are missing for some countries for some years. So we can use a portion of uh, missing data uh, to measure uh, the representation of the uh, cost. If you have a data indicator that um, all the data for all countries for all uh, years are available. That means we already have an infrastructure available for that particular indicator. 
But on the other, another hand, for the on the right hand side here, for some indicators, we uh, there are many years data are missing, many countries data are missing. So that means we don't have good infrastructure for that data, for data collection for that particular indicator. So our uh, the cost will be high for that particular indicator. All right. So here is uh, we have a uh, three steps to find the best principal indicator set. First, uh, we need to give uh, a variation goal. Uh, for this goal, we find a pr uh, principal indicator set that can explain enough variations. For example, we can tell, we say, uh, we should have a principal indicator set that can explain at least 90% of the variations. Right? So in that case, we will have an uh, uh, um, infinite number of principal indicator sets which can meet this uh, criteria. And um, of those infinite number of sets, then we set a missing rate limit. So if uh, uh, particular, uh, if uh, many indicators um, uh, data missing rate is pretty high, like uh, uh, half of the data are missing. So we get rid of those principal indicators that including uh, those uh, uh, indicators. And then we have uh, uh, a limited number of uh, uh, principal indicator set. And then we uh, evaluated the difficulties or the cost of uh, data collection for that particular set measured by the least amount of missing data. So if for a particular set, we have a least amount of missing data, that is the best principal indicator set under this particular variation goal. Right? So uh, under the 90% variation goal, of course we can change this. This is just an example of the uh, 351 SDG indicators uh, collected by uh, World Bank, we can find that only we need 147 principal indicators that can explain 90% of the variations for those 351 indicators, right? Uh, and the, as you can imagine, the cost will be much lower uh, if we only monitor those 107. So this is a uh, what those 147 indicators are. Uh, they cover uh, 14 of the 17 SDGs, and uh, some of the SDGs are, are, are not selected from this particular set, uh, but because uh, the indicators included in this set are already highly correlated with uh, those SDG indicators. All right, uh, so some insights is uh, we only need a 147 person principal indicators. Uh, to re represent at least 90% of the variations of uh, those 351 SDG indicators. Uh, but we do not necessarily recommend to stop tracking the non-principal indicators. We do recommend to regularly examine the principal indicators mm. in the future so that we can have uh, make sure all the countries have uh, uh, all those principal indicators are covered. Right? And lastly, we may consider to use AI to address the data issues in SDGs. Uh, here's a, on the top right hand corner, this is a, a information about this paper we published based on this study. Um, so I, I, when I was listening to the previous presentations, I uh, added a couple of slides about AI because I think this is probably a good solution for some of the, a lot of issues we have talked about today. So ChatGPT uh, really brings a new wave for AI, uh, but uh, they are uh, so-called foundation models uh, you can we can consider them as an undergrad student with a general education, but without a domain knowledge. Uh, so that we need to train a model to be a graduate student, a PhD, or even professionals in in a particular domain like a sustainable development or SDGs. Uh, so what we have been doing uh, in the past several uh, months is to develop a so-called uh, Tiangong AI, which is the world first, uh, perhaps the only one uh, currently large language model application in the environment and the sustainability uh, field, right? Currently average monthly visit is about 151,000. Um, the goal is to train this model to become a graduate student, PhD, or even professor in environment and sustainability major. We borrowed the name from Tiangong Kaiwa Asian Chinese book about Chinese industrial processes for this, for the name. All right, so uh, all, the, um, all the models are open sourced right now. Uh, everybody can use our source code and uh, uh, there are um, uh, community developed applications called KWU uh, that can be used uh, for, um, uh, for for a lot of uh, sustainability applications. So finally, I give you an example. Um, currently, uh, for example, I just asked the KWU uh, the application, what is the SDG indicator 12.C1 for Japan? 
unfortunately, it doesn't know anything about <laughs> SPG because right now. Uh, but if we have time and resources, we can easily uh, import the SDG uh, database, SDG uh, knowledge into this uh, system and train the model to learn those uh, information. And one day, we'll, if uh, I ask the same question, it will show us here what is a SDG uh, indicator for that particular indicator for Japan, and what is numbers for the for Japan today and in previous years, et cetera. Um, so looking, I'm also looking forward to collaborations on this uh, topic uh, with using AI for SDGs. Right. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Xu, uh, giving us a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think, yeah, this is really um, um, good uh, methodology uh, to uh, reduce the um, um, uh, numbers of uh, indicators uh, to um, um, uh, 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 two thirds, uh, two fifths of the uh, global uh, existing uh, indicators, uh, with still uh, high level of uh, variation as well as um, a lower uh, cost. And also, uh, I think the Tenkong uh, AI that you were presented uh, is very uh, interesting, uh, which uh, turned it to be a graduate uh, student or PhD student. Thank you so much. Um, with this, um, thanks to all the speakers uh, for sharing uh, your uh, insightful uh, thoughts and uh, uh, valuable uh, experiences. Um, so uh, we have uh, some time. Uh, um, so we also have um, this uh, Q&A um, uh, kind of uh, platform that um, the audience uh, can uh, raise your uh, questions. And uh, I got one. Uh, uh, in the uh, section, but I will um, uh, proceed this uh, later on. Um, so uh, first, um, I also want to uh, uh, invite Professor Baliswan again to briefly introduce our book titled Interlinkages Between the Sustainable uh, Development Goals, uh, published recently by um, Edward Elga. Uh, Professor Baliswan, please. Thank you. Can we, can we show the slide? Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the book, uh, kind of a book release in Asia. And it's my honor uh, and also pleasure to have both you and Viveka, who are contributing authors to the book. And I'm missing um, uh, Dr. Yongye uh, Min, who, along with me, is the co-editor of this book. And we work together uh, for a over two years and along with some brilliant researchers in the field. And so it's with pleasure I introduce the book. The book provides an in-depth analysis. Um, if we move to the next slide, the book on interlinkages between sustainable development goals uh, provides an in-depth analysis of the interconnections between the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of sustainable development and the five uh, pillars of SDGs in terms of peace, people, planet, prosperity, and partnerships. It examines the interlinkages at the thematic, regional, and country level, featuring cases uh, from across the globe, contributors that explore the synergies and trade-offs among the sustainable development goals using a variety of methodological approaches, ranging from qualitative, quantitative to other approaches, and also including examples of best practices and applications and demonstrating how interlinkages can be leveraged to achieve multiple SDGs simultaneously. And the contributors uh, are experts from national statistical offices, academics, um, regional and international agency experts and uh, from research centers and academia. So that it's a combination of different kinds of expertise that we have uh, been very lucky to bring together. So we invite you to read uh, the book and um, give us uh, further feedback on areas where we could develop our research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now I would like to uh, open the Q&A session. Um, so we haven't received uh, many uh, questions. Uh, I got one here. 
uh, from uh, Mustafa Muinuddin from uh, Iris. Um, so the question is addressed to uh, Professor Valiswan. Um, what are the major challenges in measuring and reporting uh, on the interconnected SDG goals and targets? And what kind of uh, global uh, initiatives do we need to support the monitoring and evaluation of SDG progress? Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, a question that most of us would love to talk uh, a lot about, but we don't have time. And in fact, I think uh, Viveka and uh, Professor Minshu uh, also spoke a little bit about this. Uh, so to summarize, of course, we, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Professor Shu, um, about USD $10 billion for data collection has been spent around sustainable development goals. Uh, but and a lot of that concentrated uh, around national statistical offices, but also international organizations. But still, if you look at the bulk of the data that has been collected, even some of the best countries don't collect more than 50% of the SDGs data. I, I think you would agree with me. And the situation of the data is pretty dire. It's a lot of missing data for sub-Saharan African countries. Um, so uh, some of the solutions were already presented by uh, Professor Shu, and I would reiterate uh, them again. A subset of variables would be one way to go. Um, Another way would be to look for indicators, proxies uh, from other well-established time series. And then uh, an alternative would also be to use alternative sources like citizen data, remote sensor data, data uh, and so on, and uh, techniques such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. But uh, perhaps other experts would like to add more. Thank you. Yeah, so um, regarding this question, may I also uh, um, invite uh, Professor Park to um, uh, to speak a couple of words on this, and also then uh, Professor uh, Xu. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I think that uh, to a large extent, this SDG uh, effort that then started 2015 has actually brought together much more data in a harmonized way than, than we ever had before. So from the stats community, which I belong to, I think we are hoping that people will use what has been collected already and make sure to, uh, to use it for analysis. Also, I was sharing the SDG uh, follow-up group for, for a while from, from the country side, uh, from the country's uh, perspective. And uh, then I got contacted by a lot of people who wanted to uh, to engage in several ways and, and who were also interested to try and solve some of the issues that are, are there. And I would say that, of course, um, it can look like it's a lot of money. On the other hand, to have a good uh, view of where your country is is something that is is valuable i would say so uh, i i'm thinking that there are a lot of issues that needs to be solved by special studies around specific things but i also think that the data set that we have is very good in in showing something that can be evaluated in a similar way all over the world so i i really would encourage you to to use the UN data and the UN da database to do this. But then, of course, always know that there will be a need for special studies where experts in one or the other area which are trying to move a policy forward, they will need other types of data. So no data system will sort of cater to all the uses. Um, the, in, the, in the European Union, the follow-up has been done so that it's about 75% of the of the UN goals that are being followed with exactly the same type of, of uh, variables. But then there is also a good use of, of existing data where we know that all the 30 countries that are involved have something that is comparable. So the, the EU follow-up is something that is sort of com combined with some of the indicators that are from the UN and they are relevant also for this area. And then part of the indicator set is also something that is being designed specifically to reach the targets that are being set for this part of the world, so to speak. So uh, I, 
Um, so in that sense, I think you know, I can understand the, the wish to try and 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 make it less, but I would also caution in the way that before we had sustainable development goals, we had sustainable development indicators, maybe ten of them for a lot of countries that also came from the UN, but with only ten we saw much less engagement because much less people felt that this was something that were, was engaging to them. So with this set of, of indicators, we are actually engaging a lot more actors, I would say, in the world. Whilst before it was more like people were sort of leaning back saying, okay, we'll see what the government can do about this thing. Because they were so general, the numbers that we were looking at, that they didn't really attract. Now we got I mean, we got contacted by pension funds. We got contacted by restaurants who wanted to do something. There were so many actors in society that felt that this also had something to bring for them. So I would say uh, that the engagement, that's what we want. We want the data to be there, but basically we want people to engage and to make sure to take this insight and, and do something with it. Thank you, uh, Professor Palm. Uh, I cannot agree more uh, uh, than what you were said uh, about uh, using uh, comprehensive indicators uh, to engage uh, uh, a lot of uh, stakeholders uh, for take action uh, for uh, achieving the SDGs. Um, so Professor Xu can also um, help address uh, this question. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, actually, I don't have too much to say about this, given what I've been already said. Uh, I, I guess uh, uh, I like the idea of the, uh, in a question, global data initiative. I think uh, uh, some organizations need to take the lead to um, to help us to um, uh, think about new, new, new ideas, new solutions. Right? For example, using AI is is a, uh, has a lot of potential, but but we need some. Uh, uh, guidance or directions or organizations think maybe IGES can do that you know <laughs> thank you um so I think it's a little bit uh, uh, over the time and um, one hour is really short and uh, uh, we have to uh, draw uh, this session uh, to a close. Uh, so I wish to express my uh, great thanks to uh, your active engagement and uh, uh, valuable uh, contributions. The insights um, shared uh, today uh, by uh, the outstanding speakers have not only illuminated the intricate um, connections uh, uh, within the SDGs, but also highlighted the importance uh, of robust uh, indicators and uh, uh, data in capturing uh, our progress uh, and uh, um, gui guiding uh, our um, uh, actions. So as we leave uh, this session, uh, let us carry with us uh, the renewed understanding and commitment uh, to uh, advancing the SDGs. So thank you once again uh, for your uh, active uh, participation. And so have a wonderful uh, evening or a day and uh, until uh, we meet uh, again. Take care. Now the session is closed. <laughs>